it's, um, it's really great to be here. Uh, my name is Steven Udo. I'm uh, an editor at Edutopia, which is a US-based publication in uh, education, and we shine a spotlight on what works in education through newsletters, uh, social media, and our website, edutopia.org. I am um, so happy to be able to facilitate this um, panel called Looking Forward uh, AI and Education. Um, it's just really hard to imagine that we'd all be sitting here in a panel about AI even just one year ago. Um, as hard it is as it is to believe, uh, ChatGPT, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, was only released November 30th of 2022, and what a difference a year has made. Um, today, it's estimated that more than a third of students in developed countries like the United States and Sweden are regularly using um, AI, uh, secondary students are regularly using AI for assignments, and in the UK, it's even higher. But uh, the pandemic has revealed a striking imbalance when it comes to the digital divide. Uh, UNESCO estimates that about 31% of students during the pandemic weren't able to access remote online learning around the world um, because of barriers to access. Um, and this spring, a separate UNESCO survey uh, highlighted um, uh, asked schools about AI and found that only 7% of schools around the world in K-12 have uh, dedicated policies to AI and 20% uh, of those schools didn't know whether or not um, the school leaders surveyed didn't know whether or not their schools did have policies when it came to AI. So there's a lot of confusion about it. And um, but there's also a lot of potential as, as we see. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lot of contrast. So with that, I'm really excited to introduce um, today's panel for a rich discussion on addressing education challenges and finding new opportunities. Um, so uh, as Jamie mentioned, you know, we have Amelia Kuskowski, who's an experience manager um, for Annie Advisor, which is based here in Helsinki. Um, we have uh, Neha Parti, the director of Quest Alliance, uh, and we have Ali Mansour, who is the founder and CEO of Livebook. Uh, so I wanted to start with you, Neha. Um, Quest Alliance creates a lot of um, technology-rich opportunities for students, and I know that you're starting to think about an overall AI strategy. Can you, you know, briefly tell us a little bit about what goes into thinking about a general AI strategy? Great. Uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me on this panel. I think it's great that we're kind of talking about well-being and learning and AI and learning kind of in the same uh, uh, design. Um, and it's much needed, I think, as a conversation. So at Quest Alliance, when we are looking at talking about AI and learning, we use a framework which we call AIL, which is basically access, engagement and learning. Um, and when we look at access, it's not just access to technology. I think like that's the first level of access that we're talking about, which is in terms of devices and internet. Um, and, and I feel like now uh, there is a need to kind of advocate for it as a fundamental right, just like right to food, right to education as well. And maybe more organizations need to kind of start advocating for it more strongly. At the second level, when we're talking about access, it's actually access to skills to be able to use the technology effectively as well. Uh, and a lot of students, even if they do have access to device and to internet as well, maybe don't know how do I use it effectively for my own learning. And the third one is access to people and resources who can actually help you navigate um, the technology for your own learning. And that's where the role of teachers, parents, mentors, community kind of comes in more strongly. Uh, so that's the access part of it. The second is the engagement part of it, that how do I use AI, how do I use technology to kind of deepen engagement with learning? That's where we tend to use a lot of data, which can help us kind of generate insights that will help us design learning experiences better. So recently we launched a chatbot, uh, which uh, is to introduce students to the basics of computational thinking. Um, and we were kind of looking at the data and, you know, um, Intuitively, you would think that weekend would be a time when kids would have more access to phones uh, and they would be using uh, the chatbot more effectively at that time. But interestingly, when we saw the data, we saw uh, that students use the chatbot during evenings uh, from Tuesday to Thursday. And we were also kind of surprised at how, why is this pattern kind of emerging? But then that helped us kind of design for nudges effectively, knowing that this is the time they're going to be using uh, the device. 
Uh, and the third part is really learning. And I feel like whenever we talk about AI, we kind of speak about personalized learning and AI and how AI has great potential uh, to kind of open that up. But I feel like we need to also spend some time understanding what personalized learning is. Right now, when we talk about using AI for personalized learning, it's in a very instructionist kind of a frame. It's like we've already decided what the student needs to learn. Uh, but AI can kind of help me pace it. Uh, you know, I can understand how much you're comprehending a certain topic and I can then change the questions and the content as per that. But if you have to make it truly personalized where it has to become more choice based, where it has to, and I think yesterday the conversations, right, that you have to kind of root learning in passion, you have to root learning in purpose. How does AI enable that when we're talking about personalized learning? And I think like there's a long way to get there because right now we're just kind of playing around with the basics of AI. So at Quest Alliance, we're also kind of thinking that how do we use AI to kind of enable personalized learning at a much deeper level where it can make <coughs> learners reflect on what is my purpose? What are really my areas of inquiry which I would like to pursue? And how does AI then enable access to a network, to mentors, uh, to really enable all of that? And I think the other thing which can happen when we talk about personalized learning uh, is just inclusion from a language perspective. India, as you all know, is a very, very diverse country. We have many languages, many dialects. Uh, AI can actually enable a lot of translation and interaction where communication can become easier. But I think there then the question becomes as to who is designing the AI. And are people really thinking of de designing AI using native languages uh, as well? And that's a big challenge right now, because even if you look at chat GPT right now, the interface is in English. Uh, so how do we kind of make those shifts are some of the questions that we're also grappling with. And I'll pause there and- Yeah, no, that's, that's great, that's great. Uh, I wanna move on to you, Amelia. You're in a really interesting position uh, on this panel because uh, any advisor works in uh, the space of mental health. And we, we really tend to see mental health supports as being this very human one-on-one -on -one connection. Um, so I'm really interested to get your uh, feedback on how AI, which you know does have a reputation of being you know very computer-based, a little a little robotic, a little overly formal, can play a role in um, in mental health supports. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so any advisor um, at the moment, we um, offer for secondary and higher education, we offer a, um, or a software and, and service that um, promotes student well-being. So that's to do with, the, with their studies and with their well-being, health in general and other issues. So at the moment, uh, we have a pre-designed message flow that um, basically sends a text message to the student, to the student's phone, um, and quite often it's um, it says something like, um, "Hi, Stephen. I hope your day is going okay. Is there anything you need help with with these themes?" And it offers a couple of themes, and then if the student chooses one, it might specify it a little bit further, and then. Um, forward the student to a staff member. So uh, the point is um, in the present service to not um, solve the student's problem with the, um, with the chatbot, but with, to forward the student to a staff member. And now we're experimenting, we're testing a large language model that, um, so this, uh, this that we're using presently is a pre-design made with um, with the staff, so with the school staff, and we're thinking um, for each student, to each phase, the, the student, the students that have just started their studies, or the students that um, go to a traineeship, or they're just about to finish their studies, or whatever their phase is, what are the most important things in that phase? What are the typical questions or the typical um, things they, they might um, have issues with and, and we serve or we offer those. And so now we're testing the large language model that's prompted to um, listen to the student, first of all, uh, and then to, to validate the student's feelings, that it's okay to feel whatever the student's feeling, um, to ask a little bit further questions and then um, and only then trying to offer like, hey, I think this sounds like you might have an issue with this thing. Uh, would it be okay for you if I tell this particular school mem uh, staff member about this? So again, it's it's not um, 
of course, the whole conversation might already have an effect on the student, that it's, it makes it easier um, to talk about some, um, if the issue is, is something that the student might not want to tell the teacher, or it's, um, uh, there's something to do with a stigma, maybe they're not comfortable with that topic, so it's easier to, to discuss it first with a chatbot, and then with the chatbot kind of together decide, okay, maybe, maybe I can tell this forward. So um, the idea is to lower the threshold and to lower the stigma to like just um, make the tough issues a little bit easier. Yeah, quick follow up. Um, students, do they feel validated by the chatbot? Can they feel validated by talking to AI? Mm -hmm. um, according to the bot, we're just, the tests are preliminary, but um, what we get overall from, from interaction with chatbot, be it with a pre designed message flow or the large language model that's more intelligent. Um, students say that it feels personal even if they know it's a bot. So it feels somebody who asks you with your first name, how's your day going? And okay, if, you're, if you don't need any help right now, uh, that's a great thing, have a good day. And it just feels good, even, even if you know <laughs> it's a machine. So, so that's one thing. Also, they're very interested in using chatbots. Um, overall, uh, the interaction with a bot is, is um, something that interests students and they're also interested in the whole procedure, like how does it go forward, what's the process, they're very like thinking about, so, so this is not um, in use right now, it's just like we're, we're interviewing <laughs> students. So they're thinking about the whole thing, like how would it work best and in what topics and so on. So yeah, that, the, um, it's pretty welcoming or it's pretty, um, yeah, there's a lot of attention. Yeah. Being drawn to, That's so. great, no, thanks. Um, so uh, Ali, you also are working um, on the student side of things, but uh, more in a curricular area. Can you talk a little bit about your, your work with AI and live book, but also, you know, how AI is stepping in to address some of these curricular challenges, like how a student would actually use AI to get some, you know, valuable feedback on, you know, working on a math assignment, for example. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. I'm sorry, my voice is a little bit coarse. It was too much karaoke last night. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew that tech could be so much? But um, I would like to um, uh, uh, occupy a, a kind of a critical uh, position on AI. I feel like um, as much as some of the tools that we're talking about and are very excited about are very new, but the problems that plague education are still very traditional. Um, to this day, all around the world, it seems that the, the most reliable predictor of academic success is still the income of parents, right? So it's not, a, it's not an educational factor. And after that is the size of the class and the efficacy of teachers. So uh, these problems seem to persist uh, no matter what technology um, we, we aim to deploy to address them. So our strategy was to, and um, this is actually another problem that I'm hearing quite a lot from, from teachers or people who tend to be critical of uh, utilization of AI technologies that we seem to be very excited about. And I think all of us as innovators or tech people are, seem to be uh, guilty of this at some point in our career too, that we get really excited about the potentials of technology, right? The, the questions that we ask like, oh, what, um, what, uh, what would make this generative AI useful? instead of asking, you know, what do the teachers need and how, how could this be addressed? Um, so we, um, we learned this the hard way. We, we tried to focus on the basics. Um, I'll give you an example. So um, in, in developing countries where there are, the classes tend to be larger and there are gaps of knowledge because the way um, the, the curriculum is designed, um, access to supplementary materials seems to have a strong influence on academic success. So the students who could afford to have uh, support, <laughs> supplementary books or, you know, tutorship, uh, they tend to outperform their peers. Uh, but in these markets, the traditional supplementary material tends to be very expensive 
and uh, they're mainly in the form of books or courses that you could sign up for 12 courses at once or something like that and they themselves by design are not very efficient because oftentimes because of these gaps tend to be very specific and different from student to student but their only solution is to buy the entire book and the research shows they mostly use like 10 to 15 or 20 percent uh, depending on their achievement status so um, we wanted to focus on this very specific problem, how we could um, use technology to overcome resource gaps, right? Um, so uh, we started with a, with a very basic premise. We said, okay, what is the most common denominator in the, in the hands of the students in these countries are the textbooks, right? Because the, the curriculum is centralized. So we thought if we could, if we could provide them a tool that would, that would add to, to the resources that they are already using, maybe they would be a step in the right direction in terms of uh, overcoming those resource gaps. So our, our first attempt was we designed, uh, we used um, computer vision technology to develop an AR platform where students could um, point their camera at their textbooks at each page that they had. And we would recognize what page it was, what subject matter it was um, talking about, and it would show all the related material that was added by us, our admins, or students, or other teachers. So, in a way, it was a um, it was a strategy to 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 combat what was missing from the traditional approach. So it was uh, where the books tend to be one glove fits all. This was you know, full of micro material that the students themselves could personalize. So I, I agree with you, personalization is a kind of a loaded question. And I don't think we have a good grip on it. So our, you know, we thought it would be safer just to uh, outsource this, the personalization part to the student themselves to provide them with the options and they themselves could choose what would meet their needs. And uh, also uh, by including the student community and the teacher community in um, sort of annotating their, uh, their source material, it would be, uh, they could take it more of an active part in, in their learning. So I'm, I'm an advocate for um, um, deployment of new technologies in a very simple way, as opposed to, okay, this is the latest, you know, the large language model, I mean, not, not in your case, but I think when we're, when we're talking about foundational skills and curriculum, it tends to be very, uh, um, much more complicated and i think this is this is a problem because of um, so much of educational policy is being influenced or dictated by tech billionaires now in north america and all around the world and they tend to bring with themselves this disruptive mentality that okay uh, new technology and its capabilities could have the potential to fix you know fix um, traditional problems within an industry but education is probably one of the most um, uh, difficult and multifaceted uh, uh, sectors that exist, not only because there's so many stakeholders, but because there's so many nuances in the in the uh, experience of learning itself. So I think that the disruptive mentality, as much as it is rewarded in entrepreneurship in education, I think it could be a, a double-edged sword. So I think as as innovators, uh, if you could call ourselves that, um, we should sort of take a back seat and um, look at what's happening and where the gaps are in the pre-existing processes and how we could augment those things as opposed to looking at, okay, this is the potential of technology and why don't we reimagine um, uh, education in, in its entirety, so, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I wanted to pass it back to you, Nea, uh, and just ask, uh, you also, Quest also works with leadership teams, with um, parent and family engagement, with adults. How are you thinking differently about um, introducing and talking about AI to adults um, compared with kids? Right, I'll just build off what uh, Ali just shared, and it kind of reminds me of a couple of interactions I had uh, in schools with teachers. So we had done a hackathon uh, where we had invited students and uh, teachers. They were supposed to go through a design thinking process. And we had kind of, you know, created a lot of exposure for them for different kinds of technology. So we had a chat GPT corner there as well. Uh, so it was interesting. The kids came, they explored chat GPT and they're like, oh, wow, you know, I, this can help me like do my homework. Uh, and then the teachers came and they were like, oh, wow, this can help us make our lesson plan. So it almost sounded like chat, the entire education is going to happen via chat GPT. Uh, and the learners and kind of educators are not kind of going to interact with each other. So we had to kind of, you know, work with them to say that there are only certain things that this technology can enable and it can't replace the human sort of relationship 
part of learning um, and the fact that the greatest sort of purpose of learning is to help you make uh, is to help you kind of reflect and make meaning um, so how do we kind of you know uh, use technology to kind of support that and it can maybe take the information part out of your sort of you know purview because a lot of it is now available you just need to maybe able to know how to ask the right kind of questions uh, so that's one part of it i think the second uh, uh, classroom observation that i was doing was this teacher had had a smart class set up uh, for them in a public school they were very excited very proud uh, that they have this in their classroom um, and they had kind of selected a video uh, to show to the students about uh, the concept of refraction and it had three experiments very simple experiments that you put a pencil in a glass of water and it kind of you know the angle breaks depending on when you are um so the teacher was very proud that see now i can use all of this in the classroom to help explain a concept better but for me i think what stayed was that you know that school has a glass it has a pencil you can just ask every student to do that experiment themselves you don't need technology to teach that concept so what we need to do with teachers is to be able to work with them on how do you want to use technology effectively um and get them to reflect on what is the meaning making i want to enable in students and not just kind of use it to replace how information is being passed on to students so i think but it's a great opportunity for us because i see like adults really really excited about it i feel like they've been used to an education system which has been so monotonous over the years that technology and ai is really giving them an opportunity to kind of think of their classroom processes differently what is needed is this hand holding for teachers where they are also asking reflective questions about their own purpose as educators and then seeing where best to kind of place technology um and i think just building on that usually technology is always seen as a retrofit in education right someone else has designed the technology with certain features and then we ask ourselves how best can i use this feature versus saying that this is the problem i need to solve for what kind of technology needs to be designed for that and that's where i think we need a lot more collaboration between technologists between uh, people who are working with pedagogy even behavior scientists for that matter to kind of come together and think about thoughtful design and technology uh, as well that's great um i mean i do want to save a few minutes for q and a in case you all have some questions but amelia can i ask you quickly um how do you and your team um see ai in your workflow are you using it you know as a as an organization i mean do you know how how do you how do entrepreneurs really think about improving their workflow with ai um this is an interesting question because i'm uh, i guess my um I'm very hopeful, but very careful, and uh, in a way, I'm very traditional as well. Um, I I like to do like some things. Um, I'm I'm I don't consider myself as a pioneer, even if I work at a in a startup. <laughs> but um, there are team members that work uh, that use it far more than I do, and I haven't really replaced. Like I don't know. Of course, there are. Like afterwards, I might think of things that I I do, <laughs> but I haven't really replaced much uh, with AI, and it's more um, it's more explorative at the moment than it's like an actual routine, like a daily or weekly or something that I would do with it all the time. I can't give an example that what I would <coughs> replaced with it. Yeah. Do, do the other panelists have? Is anyone else have a? Have a thought. <coughs> yeah, or just using it in your workflow. I personally, in my workflow, I I use ChatGPT for writing proposals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it does help kind of structure structure your thoughts a little bit. But I think like in the learning space, um, uh, we're kind of using it not to replace anything, but really to supplement uh, it. So I think like for us, we do a lot of work around career exploration for young people. So how do we kind of consolidate the data to help young people kind of pursue pathways which are based on their interests and abilities kind of a thing um in india we anyways have a shortage of a lot of sort of trained counselors so we would actually want to use like how there is a mental health uh, chatbot we would want to build a chatbot which can offer sort of foundational career exploration um information Uh, because we lack career counselors in the country right now, so it's not necessarily a replacement, but really a supplement uh, in our context right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And, and before we take um, audience Q&A, Ali, can you share a little bit about your own research um, or, or just basically explain how we can all get started in um, kind of doing more, more research in AI on our own? Sure. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so um, going, going back to, to your point, I think the, um, uh, th this whole fantasy of AI replacing teachers has um, not only theoretically is problematic, but the, the increasingly the, the data and the research shows us that it's not an effective intervention strategy. I think it was two weeks ago that uh, um, uh, the, the summit project by Zuckerberg, um, after you know pouring in over $100 million investment, they had to pivot for this idea of hyper AI assisted personalization because it wasn't the, the data showed that it wasn't effective. Um, it, the baselines weren't weren't changing. It goes to show you that, um, as as the expert would, and the literature would suggest, that uh, there's no replacement for in class, you know, peer based learning. And uh, the the more we want to utilize technology to hyper personalize learning, um, we we might be negating questions of social identity and the, the shared experience of learning. At the same time, I think. Um, uh, not only is it a question of practice and mechanisms, it's, uh, there's also um, philosophical questions that need to be asked. What is the what is the nature of our relationship with knowledge, right? If if ChatGPT, we're all using it, right, in one way or another, uh, either to supplement our pre-existing workflows or the way we access or organize information. So I think that this is this is a this is a very serious question that needs to be asked at the same time. That how do we use the tools to augment pre-existing processes but what are the what is, what is the nature of those processes as well so going back to the question of teachers um, I think everyone we talked to and so many people in the audience are also working on this problem that we know there's a the, the number one problem facing education is the teachers right the shortage of teachers and it seems, it seems to be systematic um, all continents face it to varying degrees and um, at the same time, we know that the effective teaching is the it is the is the most significant predictor of academic success, at least the educational one. And by by some estimates, um, it's it varies between forty million to sixty million teachers that the world needs to meet the um, to meet the uh, development goals. Almost the same number of teachers that exist, right? And there. And uh, the, um, the observation from, I was very surprised to hear this from lots of people from Finland, that there seems to be a declining interest in the, in the position of teaching, right? As, uh, as seems to be, um, if you used to be a teacher in my country, or I, I heard the same thing in our dinner last night, that it was the same thing in Finland, that you used to be an elite, right? You, had, you would enjoy high social status. And uh, time and time again, when we talk to teachers, um, obviously, the pay gap and uh, and this, the, the salary is a big problem, but the social status is also a, a major factor of people uh, not being incentivized to becoming teachers. So I think it's it's uh, unless there's a miracle, we're not going to be we're not going to be um, meeting those targets of you know uh, doubling our our t teacher community. So I think as as technologists, this should be our mission to think what kind of tools could we provide the existing teachers to 10x their efficacy. And this is what we're working on. So everyone talks about um, teacher shortages, but what does that really mean? So one is the quantitative problem. There aren't enough teachers, right? And two is the teachers that exist are forced to teach in the areas that they're not really qualified for to, to fill up the gap, right? And three is the classes are large, right? And four in lots of countries because of these because of this situation and kind of self perpetuating circumstances, the students themselves are not very proficient and they, they sort of carry on with the gaps of knowledge. And lastly, because of this whole decli declining social status problem, teachers aren't incentivized to skill up, right? They see teaching either as a temporary career or um, they just don't see any value in in um, in um, learning new skills or adopting new skills. Um, so this is a situation we have. We Time and time again, we talked yesterday about that uh, teachers already feel their burden with lots of work, so they're not, you know, even if they're, they're, they, they, they like to learn new things, you know, it's, it's really hard for them to find the time or the energy or the effort. So I think our strategy should be, if, if this, is the, this is the situation that we're faced with, 
um, how can we intervene effectively at the different touch points that these teachers, based on their circumstances, rely on technology? I'll give you an example. Most of the teachers that we talk to in these countries, because they're not very, uh, they don't have a holistic view of their teaching, what, what they're teaching and what the lesson goals are, um, they tend to search what they need to teach the night before, what they need to go to class to teach the next day. So they go on YouTube, they go on, uh, or the equivalent of YouTube in these countries, or Instagram, uh, which is, you know, which is not the most, um, which is not the most, uh, uh, sensible way of you know of uh, arranging your teaching strategy but it op it offers a opportunity right it means they're you know they're relying on technology so um, what we are working on is again back, going back to what you were saying to um, taking our approach based on what the teachers are already doing and seeing like what could be an effective uh, point of intervention so can we um, for example, can we can we make the lesson planning a little bit more cohesive? If they're going on YouTube, maybe we could, you know, provide a platform where the material is not very disparate. It's all um, it's all connected with a with a, a sort of a unifying idea behind it. Um, homework tends to take a lot of time, and teachers are expected to go through all the problem sets, for example, in math, right? And just the act of asking each student come to the front of class, ask, write the question one time, and then the next person comes and believe this takes up a big chunk of time. And again, you were, you know, a lot of times the, 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 the gaps or the, the urgency of the things that are, that is really um, posing a lot of problems to them are not very technological. We went to a lot of classes and we're like, oh, we got this hyper personalized strategy for you to, you know, personalize your lessons. And they were like, you know what? If I if I if I give out different lessons to my or different uh, problem sets to my students, that means there are more there'll be more questions for me to go through in the class because I'm expected to do all of them. And the other problem is that this, the parents would come and say, "Why are you discriminating against my child? Why is my child having less homework than the other ones?" So there there's a lot of uh, it seems to be a lot of cultural and uh, paradigm issues as well. Um, so. And uh, and the parents, that's the parents that we, we talked about as well. Um, so they, the, the amount of time that's wasted dealing with parents is unbelievable in these in, in these conditions. And that 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 doesn't have to be a necessarily an AI problem or a, you know a AI strategy. So I, I feel like these are all the significant um, touch points in the pre-existing cycles, and all of them could be augmented by um, by a more intelligent. Um, sort of mechanism, whether it's totally AI enabled or it's, you know, it's, it's some kind of algorithmic structure. Um, so it, again, going back, I think it's if we involve teachers as uh, co-designers in this process, um, it's hitting two birds uh, with the same stone. Because not only you're, um, you're taking into account what is needed to be done, you know, instead of falling in love with the solution, you're focusing on the problem. But it's also diplomatically, I think it's it's uh, it's more intelligent in terms of paving the way for adoption later on. If they feel like they own the technology, if they feel like they were part of the design process, um, it's more likely that it's uh, attuned to uh, what they need to do essentially, eventually, but it's also, uh, they would be good advocates for the wider adoption of those technologies. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, do we have time for a question? We can have one question. We can have one question. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. You all spoke a lot about how AI can support interventions in educational um, outcomes, but I didn't hear a lot about how AI can augment how we measure and monitor educational outcomes. Um, do you have any comments or any experiences that you've seen in how we monitor well-being, how we monitor student learning, how we might be able to better measure some of these elusive outcomes in different ways? Was this your mic? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, that's a very good question. Diagnostic is, is one area that we're really uh, concentrating on because especially after COVID, 
in elementary levels, there seems to be a lot of students that, uh, that lack the foundational skills in numeracy and uh, literacy. So uh, a lot of teachers, basically, they, they understand that there seems to be um, significant problems, but they don't just, they don't have the, they don't have the time or the resources to focus on those problems in a very targeted way. Or it's kind of hard for the teachers themselves to have the, have the skills to realize what the prerequisites of, of the existing uh, deficiencies are. So what we're, we thought that was a, that, that would be a, a kind of a useful tool to provide to the teacher. So we're basically providing these, uh, this network of uh, interrelated concepts between different skill sets, um, um, spurred between different subjects. So you, this is a very classic case. Uh, you would you would go to the fifth grade science and, and the child can't do the problem set and you realize, oh, this, this is not the problem with the concept or the science-based concept. It's the math problem, it's the calculation skill that's not up to date and it's from two grades behind. And not all teachers have the skills to realize that because as we said, they're, they're sort of pushed into classrooms where they're not qualified to teach. And if they did, they don't have the time or they don't have the resources to take care of that. So diagnostic, I think, is one area that um, AI strategies and AI tools could be hugely beneficial in terms of uh, unloading and unburdening the teacher's time in, in understanding what the problems are and addressing those problems in a very targeted way. Yeah, that's great. Um, I don't know if this um, answers your question, but um, we are... Um, we're measuring like if our messages that gets get sent to the students, um, we're measuring if they have any if it, if they are of use by asking the the students. Two weeks after they've gotten the first message, we send a new message saying like, "Hi, um, a couple weeks ago you got a message um, and you requested support for this thing. So did you get help?" And the student can say. Yes, I got help. The thing got sorted, or um, I'm still like it's still in progress, or I didn't get help. And then, if we look at thousands of students, like um, most, like the biggest uh, organizations or the schools are thousands of students. Then, okay, there the, it seems that the students aren't getting help in these themes. Should we do something about it? And they, so maybe I don't know if you were going something along those lines but we're measuring kind of how the students are getting help and if there is some gaps that they, they get extra yeah, help yeah, so. that's great uh, unfortunately i do think that we are um out of time so but thank you can you um can you all give me help me give me a hand to